Father Joe, how are you doing? Good, brother. How are you? Doing well, thanks. Hi, everyone. Whew. You ready to go? Ready to go. Awesome. Will you start us off with a prayer? Yeah. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, we thank you and praise you for the gift of this day today. Asking special blessing upon uh, all of our mothers, living, deceased. Ask your blessing upon our time tonight. That you would guide us by the gift and the grace of your Holy Spirit. This time would be fruitful according to your, your desires, Jesus. That we would grow in deeper love for you. Greater understanding of our faith that would lead to deeper love for you. We ask you to come, Holy Spirit, come by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thanks, Father Joe. Just a welcome to everyone. Thanks for um, being here for this next edition of Stump the Priest Q&A. Glad you're, glad you're here and hope you're ready to keep coming. Uh, just Father Joe and I, I know we've talked about it, we've just been really grateful and edified by a lot of questions and um, yeah, just grateful for your, your openness and um, intrigue. I think we were also saying, you know, just another word of encouragement to, to really be free, right? The, these questions don't have to be anything at all, whether it's doctrinal or apologetic or Marian, we're, we're happy with those or personal. I mean, they can maybe to maybe encourage, like they can be personal. If it's just something that, that's on your mind, there's no question that, um, I don't know, you never know what's relevant to another person. So, yeah. and if it is personal, we can keep it confidential or just um, ask, ask it for your friend who, you know, is really struggling with uh, a certain question. Um, Father Joe, it's, it's Mother's Day, and yeah, I didn't know if um, you had a just kind of an insight or a take today on, on Mother's Day, and did you reach out to your mother today? I did, yeah. We, uh, I went over there, and uh, we had a nice meal together, so that was good. Distance, across the table, that kind of thing. Um, Air five. <laughs> it was really nice. I talked about one of my favorite statues. I think I've talked about the Ave Regina Pachis here before, but somebody asked me to do a little video and uh, just as an encouragement to, to go to our Blessed Mother, which you all have been getting for the past six weeks or something like that since you've been doing this, but Google the statue Ave Regina Pachis if you haven't. It's a very, very beautiful statue of our Blessed Mother and St. Mary Major. So she was... She was one that I ran to often. So I, when I made the video, I just said, encourage everybody to run to your mother, which is what you guys have been doing for weeks now. So good. Um, let me see if I can pull it up real quick. Yeah, that's sweet. Um, thanks for sharing. It's an awesome day. So just a happy Mother's Day to, to all of you and it's grateful for the gift of motherhood. I love, you know, St. John Paul II says that all women are called to motherhood, uh, that it's, it is, it is a gift, but it's also, it's the vocation of the feminine vocation of saying yes to, to bearing and giving forth life. And uh, whether that's biological or spiritual, motherhood is, is something that's ingrained in, in women, stamped into their bodies, John Paul II would say, and is theology of the body and, and that's just a, a beautiful thing and I think maybe in our modern contemporary age there's just like I don't know such almost a rivalry but I just think it does such us all such a good service to reverence the gift of maternity even femininity and that ability to to bear life um so one of the things I've always been grateful for in our Catholic tradition is that we veil things that are, are holy, and particularly those things that bear life. And so if you've ever seen someone in church wearing a, a chapel veil, 
sometimes there's a bad connotation with it that it's uh, demeaning or kind of a lessening of the female sex or something. It's actually a reverencing, right? That that women would have their heads covered. It's this recognition and reverence of they, unlike anybody else, have the gift, superpower almost, to bear life. Think about the other things that we veil in church. If you've ever seen the chalice veiled, it's because that chalice is able to hold the very life of Jesus Christ, the person. Um, tabernacles are often veiled too. It's something that contains life, the body of Christ. And um, yeah, just a, a beautiful thing. So um, to you women, uh, especially mothers today, thank you. So we have some um, questions coming in. If you're ready, let's, let's jump into those. Great. Uh, we have a question. Could you talk about the Great Schism and why the Roman Catholic Church split from the Eastern Orthodox Church? What are the main differences between the two? Oh, man. That's a, that's a big time question. Uh, I'd have to think about that for a little bit. I mean, I'll be, I know the, you know, the proceeds from the Father and the Son, but other than that, you know, I haven't studied that in a long time. Why don't you go ahead? Great. How about we paint with broad strokes and um, pull this together? So it's worth appreciating once again, right? The, the church was united from the very beginning. And if you read the church fathers, like, how did you know if you were a Christian or not? And by Christian, we mean Catholic. It was that you had a connection to the apostles, all right? You were able to trace your lineage back to the apostles. And so as the apostles went out and started spreading the gospel at the very beginning, they set up especially like different hotspots, different seas around the world. And um, the principal sea was Rome from the very beginning. If you read like St. Um, the, the first letters of St. Clement, he talks about Rome as having this primacy. And this was pretty generally understood. And yet there's also the church in Constantinople, the church in Antioch, and, and other places around the globe. And yet they were all united on the successor of St. Peter in Rome. And so if, if you were Christian, you were Catholic, especially for the first thousand years. And one of the things that was just beautiful about that is that, yeah, you're all united and you know that you have access to Jesus and his church. The actual great schism um, happened in the 11th century. We talk about um, some theological differences. Also, as we've come to really appreciate it, not just theological differences, but even more minutely, language differences, right? So as the church is growing, she's also developing her doctrine and understanding of what it means that God is a trinity of persons and yet one being. And what does it mean that Jesus is one divine person and yet two natures and all of these things that really get um, spelled out in the ecumenical councils. One of the uh, things that really came into tension was how to describe the divinity of the Holy Spirit and its relation to the Father and the Son. And as Father Joe was talking about, the, the word in, in Latin was the filioque, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. And so this is, this is something that we could go, we could do a whole hour-long show on, and I don't know if anyone is actually still interested or listening to me, but um, what came down to a really important distinction was um, how do we talk about objectively and accurately the Holy Spirit's relationship to the Father and the Son, proceeding from just one or from both or the Father first and then the Son? And I guess maybe even more accurately in terms of what the schism was about, authority. Who has the right to say what language is going to be used and who needs to be able to accept it? Because if Rome over here is saying, nope, the filioque that we're using in Latin is different from the Greek word that you're using over in Constantinople or wherever, like, who has the right to say? Well, it seems like Rome does very clearly. 
And yet the East wasn't having it. And it was really over this. And it wasn't, I mean, I think as we've come to know it, there's been a lot of theological development on this. We've come to understand it. In essence, we believe the same thing about the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son simultaneously and uniquely. Um, and yet because of the language differences, uh, it's, it's really been detrimental. Can we take a moment to grieve this schism, to grieve this break in what was so united, right? Jesus prayed in John chapter 17 that they would all be one, that it's the unity of the church that is this great sign to the world. And just to consider that a thousand years ago, the church broke, ruptured in a way that she's never recovered from. And then another 500 years later in the 16th century, of course, we have the Protestant Reformation and fractured even more. Right, so think about how like we're almost an anti-sign by how many divisions we have amongst ourselves, and um, that's that's really detrimental. Sorry, that was maybe a much longer answer. Um, what are the main differences between the two? That could be a whole other um, thing. I mean, in the East, you're going to have in so many ways the same sacraments. You're going to have. Uh, maybe a little bit different understanding in terms of priesthood. The Eastern Church has an understanding still of married priests. Celibate priests are, are not the primary discipline. Um, liturgies are a little bit different. In the Orthodox churches, you have um, a, a lot more is hidden between like the people and the priest and um, Maybe a number of other things. Father Joe, anything you want to add to this? Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, about you. the question was about, it was a great, very good response. But, you know, you asked the question about Roman Catholics. But within the, the Catholic tradition, if you look at the Byzantine Catholics, I know you asked about Roman, but Byzantine Catholics and Ukrainian Catholics, who are also under Rome, under the Pope, um, You'll, you'll see a lot more similarities as far as liturgy goes in a married priesthood. So there's different rites within the Catholic Church. And if you want to have a good look at what the, you know, the Orthodox liturgy would look like, I think, I think it'd be fair, Father Adam, to say the Byzantine Ukrainian rites would look a lot more similar to an Orthodox liturgy than a Roman Catholic right would. And there's plenty of Byzantine and Ukrainians in Pittsburgh. There are. So under, under, the, under the Roman Catholic Church, you have the Latin rite that most, most of us are a part of, but then you also have a Byzantine rite. Um, and those are all validly, licitly, Roman Catholic. And um, yeah, there's Byzantine, Ukrainian, all, all would share a same reverence for the Holy Fathers, being a successor of Peter, etc. So yeah, hope that, hope that helps. But once you, so, but that's different. So there was a, a question about the difference between Roman Catholic, Byzantine Catholic, and Coptic Catholic. Um, Coptic, as I understand it, are, are not under the Roman Roman Catholic Church, like a Greek or Russian Orthodox. Um, forgive me if I'm wrong, if any of you are Coptic, but... Um, there are some Coptics. There, there okay. is a Coptic right, yeah, in Egypt. I actually stayed with them in, uh, in Cairo. It's pretty wild. The Coptics often on their... Um, right here you see a cross. They often get a cross tattooed on the web of their hand right there all right you see that a lot and yeah we stayed with some in, in with some coptics in in uh, cairo and man it was like they were so persecuted it's amazing christian guys we're still very much persecuted uh physically i mean not just like uh politics this and that but you know the holy land especially catholics are being persecuted in a serious way and the Coptics that I was with in Egypt also. 
Beautiful. Thanks for those questions. Hopefully that's um, helpful. I don't, I don't know if this is me being a math guy or a sports guy. I kind of see things in a March Madness bracket sometimes in terms of how the church, like I'm a visual person. So to see like in the very beginning, there was one church and then around the 11th century, we split into two and then around the 15th. And it's like to see all of the different rites come and that all of those who come through Rome um, and go back to Jesus are legit. Um, there are some great t-shirts that ask the question like, who started your church? And on the back, <laughs> you can have like um, all like all the different leaders who started their different churches in the last hundred years, two hundred years, like five hundred years ago. Martin Luther started my church, and like it's only the Roman Catholic Church that can go back and say, Jesus started my church, right? Like that's an incredible thing. And so to be able to appreciate our our roots is going all the way back to Jesus Himself uh, and Matthew. Chapter 16, saying, Peter, you are the rock on which I will build my church. It's this incredible gift. Great. Another question. Um, Susan is asking, what is the penitentiary rosary? How is it different than the regular rosary? This question is related to the request from Akita's message in October 2019. Father Joe, do you know anything about the penitentiary rosary? Not one thing. But don't tell anybody. All right, everybody, that stays within this group of <laughs> Yeah, it's something that I'm not super familiar with either. I know the apparitions of Our Lady of Akita are powerful and even very relevant to our, our day today, but I also don't feel comfortable enough to really comment on it right now. Susan, sorry, I promised to look into it and, um, and get back to you next time. We can maybe start with that one and I'll, I'll give you a, a full answer. Thanks for your question though. Um, Mary Angela has a question that she has a scriptural rosary book. And while we're doing the beating of the Hail Mary, is it okay for me to be reading the scriptures and joining in this the second part of the Hail Mary. Mary Angela, absolutely. Yeah, it's, um. so if you understand what she's saying, well, we're praying the rosary, she's reading the, the scriptural verse for each one to be able to follow along. And I think that's a, a nice practice to be able to um, continue to follow along and enter more deeply into the, the rosary. Yeah, sounds super beautiful. Father Joe, what's one of your favorite stories or memories of your mom? <laughs> that is a loaded question. Man, did my mom write that in? Is that who? <laughs> it's not. Um, it's. <laughs> That's great. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> so many great. You know, I. I uh, this is a great memory. When I hope she wouldn't mind me sharing this. But one of the funnest memories, my mom is, I, my personality is that I take after my mom, my other brothers and sisters who are much smarter and more responsible than me take after my dad. Uh, but my mom is just super fun loving. She's very, very fun. Uh, she's really fun to trap, like when she travels, you know, she, she was, she's a Pittsburgher. She stayed in Pittsburgh, hasn't traveled much, but, but the little that we've traveled, I, you know, they came over to Europe when I was over there. She was so fun because everything evokes wonder for her. And, uh, so she's always ready to have a good time. And, uh, <laughs> we bought her way back, man. I must've been like a teenager. I had to be maybe probably 25 years ago. We bought her a pair of rollerblades. <laughs> you guys remember for like at Christmas or Easter, or maybe it was Mother's Day even, I can't remember. But well, where my, my oldest brother David passed away and he's buried at Queen of Heaven Cemetery, uh, which is out in the South Hills. And Queen of Heaven has some really great like curves and roads. <laughs> so we all went out there. Well, you know, we're like super reverent and we putting flowers on my brother's grave and everybody else's grave all the time. 
But there was like a really good up, if you go around the, uh, what's a big thing where people who are buried above ground called mausoleum? Mm-hmm. So this is how funny and crazy uh, we were. Somebody was driving the car and myself and my mom were holding onto the bumper with rollerblades on going around the cemetery. <laughs> so that would be one of That's my, amazing. Uh, until somebody came by and was like, hey, it's a cemetery. <laughs> we're like, yeah, we know. Like, her son's buried here. My brother's buried. We we're just praying and having some fun, you know? <laughs> so I'd love to see that. Um, it's a great image of you two. Thanks, Jim. That's a great question. Fun question. Um, I was going to share the story of, um, yeah, hopefully my mom doesn't mind me sharing. Um, a couple years ago, probably about eight or so years ago, uh, we were coming back from a family vacation in Florida and we took the opportunity to drive all the way back. And my dad is just a great planner. I mean, he has every mile planned out to what gas station we're going to stop at. And we had to like the, the first day, like we were going to be ambitious. And we were going to travel all the way up, I think maybe like to Virginia or something. We were just like going in the last, you know, six, seven hours we'll, we'll do the next day. And for whatever reason we got there and it was just like right around the border, every single hotel was full. We felt like the Holy family unable to get a spot in the inn. And we went from like one hotel to the next and right. My dad and all of his planning, I don't know. It just like couldn't come through. And I have my brother, Jonathan, this like wild man, he's number two of six. And he's like, dad, don't worry. Adam and I will drive the rest of the way. We've got it. Um, and we were caravanning ourselves in my large family. We had two cars and my dad is just like, absolutely not like I am not like entrusting my whole family to you two Adam I'm okay with Jonathan no way and um after like the fifth or sixth hotel that was full and Jonathan just like begged like we'll drive we'll drive we'll drive finally my dad's like fine (laughs) and my brother and I we load up on all these energy drinks and just (laughs) take off and my mom and I were in the the front seats of the one car and you know she was trying to stay awake but just dozing dozing and finally she woke up and she was like Adam I just feel so bad it's like 2 a.m in the morning I'll I'll keep you awake hey what's in this energy drink and she <laughs> took like one sip of this I don't know Starbucks double espresso like energy drink and she was alive and rocking. She, we went back through my mom's entire family history. She started telling me like story after story of people that I didn't even know existed. All the different like dramas, all of the different tensions and all of the different like miracles and glory stories. And all of a sudden it's like four hours later and she's still going and made like, <laughs> we made it all the way through. And, and then she crashed right as, right as we passed into the yeah, state line. And anyway. Just a a great story. My mom just has like an incredible memory and appreciation of different stories, relationships, and um, that's hilarious. Yeah, great, grateful for for that memory among many other. Okay, another Mother's Day question: Who are saints that are amazing mothers? Who you think would be on your top three mom saints in the Catholic Hall of Fame? Oh, thanks, Nikki, for that awesome question. That is an awesome question. You want me to go? Please. Yeah, I I would, uh, right off the bat, and this is not a New Testament saint, but in the book of 2 Maccabees, the mother of the seven sons, the Maccabean sons, they they all get martyred. This is gruesome. It's brutal. But they get martyred in front of her. And she, the whole time, is encouraging them with the most like beautifully poetic lines like she especially the youngest child to the book of second maccabees so just look that up i think it's like i don't know where it is but second maccabees somewhere um and the youngest child is being martyred and she has this incredible uh theology basically i don't know how you are brought into being in my womb um, but I know that the one who did that will give you back to me for all eternity if you stay faithful to him. So she'd be, re- I mean, that top, I don't know, top whatever. It's hard to rank them, but 
the mother of the sons of Maccabees. Woo! She's right there. Um, yes, I, you know, it's like Jesus had a grandmother, you know, St. Anne. So it's like pretty cool, you know, the mother of Mary, the grandmother of Jesus. Like, can you imagine her, like, with Jesus? Well, must have just been incredible. Like, God is my grandson. What's your grandson doing? You know, like, what did he make of himself? Mine just walked across the Sea of Galilee. You know, like, so I love her. Um, I think Zeely Martin, the parents of St. Therese of Lisieux, have been canonized. Uh, Zeely and Louis Martin. So uh, I, 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 they'd be in my top whatever, 10 parent saints. That's awesome. I just heard something about Pope St. John Paul II's parents um, being looked at to be beatified as well, which is super awesome and, and fitting. Um, just um, two parents went through incredible, just tough times and raised a, a holy son. Yeah. Monica obviously needs to be given some, some credit. I think a lot of people know about Monica, but one story that I love about her that doesn't get enough credit is the one where Augustine's leaving Africa to go up to Milan to kind of pursue his career there and uh, Monica wants to follow him and so Augustine tells Monica it's like, yeah you know I'm leaving on the, the first boat tomorrow morning to, to leave to Rome and then to go up and she's like oh okay great I'll meet you there well, he takes off on the boat that left that night, <laughs> ditched oh. his mom uh, in Africa, and then went off up, up to Milan. And so that you know the heart of Monica, she wasn't dismayed, right? She did get on that next boat, and she did go up and follow him. And I mean, this is the fourth century, so that's not easy to go on a boat, on a ship on your own, travel across the country as, as a woman. And okay, she did it. She tracked him down. And I can just imagine, right? incredible holy woman and yet Augustine just wanted nothing to do with her and then I can only imagine whenever they came across each other once again and reunited in Milan it's like god mom what are you doing here but it's like no I'm, I'm not letting you go like I'm not giving up on you which is just an incredible witness to her faithfulness and, and trust in the Lord so, yeah, thank you, moms, for your perseverance and your falling away children and just to continue to, to trust as Monica did, like praying through the, even the power of her tears. It's super efficacious. There, there's an amazing image of the scene you just described. Father Kim Shrek is the pastor of uh, St. Monica Parish in Chippewa. And there's a, a woman in Pittsburgh who actually lost her, her husband in the Iraqi war right after they got married. And so they had the wedding at Sacred Heart Church. And I believe less than a year later, they had the funeral at Sacred Heart Church. So she's a, a woman of incredible depth of prayer. She painted an image uh, of that scene. And you can see she's, she's just, St. Monica is just pouring her heart out to the Lord. And there's a tiny little like boat uh, leaving in the background and it's saint augustine so that that would be an amazing amazing image to check out i don't know how you i think i just i tried to look it up real quick but i, I can look for it and post it or something i don't know how that happens um yeah i think we have some other people who might be able to do it and i know anna posted the ave regina pachis image already on the chat so we have some competent Google searchers out there. Okay, this is a question um, for both of us. As we look forward to the opening of our churches, this person never thought that they would feel like they were afraid or apprehensive of walking about in church. They fear that they will be so stressed in going in and sitting there that it will mitigate any type of prayer. They know that they're supposed to trust but just simply don't know how to feel. Do we have any insight for this person? Do we as a priest have fear about the potential of returning? Well, I, I would just um, affirm 
your honesty. You know, it's, that's beautiful. Like, and we don't want to suppress our feelings, right? You guys know psychology 101. You want to feel what you're feeling. Because if you don't feel what you're feeling and you push your feelings down, they're going to come out sideways. So even you expressing your feelings, it can be a way of like beginning to ease the tension in your heart. I'm afraid. I'm scared. Uh, personally, I, I'm not. I'm, you know, I'm also 41 years old, so you know, I feel like I'm pretty healthy. So I, I'm not too worried about that at all myself. But certainly understand that fear. I don't. You know, I can't give any medical data or other kind of data. I know that we are going. That everyone who has a church open is going to do a lot of cleaning because not just because we want to, but because we're being required to do serious serious cleaning um, of our churches. It's going to be a constant thing. A lot of work for our churches to open up just as far as cleaning goes. So I think that's that's a big thing. So practically, I would say there's a lot of cleaning and a lot of steps being done. Spiritually, I would say, you know, make sure you're sharing that with the Lord. I'm scared, Lord. I'm nervous about this. What do you have to say to that, Jesus? Let's see where the invitation is. Yeah, I do. I do think I appreciate the honesty too, and I think that's um, probably a little bit more accurate than maybe a a sense that some people have that once the restrictions are lifted, once the church doors are open, then everyone's just going to come rushing back. And I'm just not convinced that that's going to be the the case. I think a lot of people are going to be apprehensive to to come back to church, and and not just to church but it's to be around big large groups of people again and you know it's it's one of the the hard should we, can we say like side effects of the social distancing i shared the experience that was kind of painful early on in social distancing i i had someone um come up to me it was someone i was kind of excited to see and we started talking and and i took a step towards him and he took a step away from me and it was this really like painful experience that like someone was moving away from me, like in fear of me. And this was before I tested positive or anything, right? Was, he was just social distancing. He was being cautious and it was like, no, good. But that's a hard human experience. And then I know I'm not the only person who's experienced that, that we've all as a culture of experience this, like I need to keep away from people that's going to be hard to, that's going to need some healing, I think, for a lot of people to overcome and just trusting. Maybe even after we were all vaccinated and we're all, you know, whatever, like safety wise, it's like, we're still going to have to come to, to trust one another again. And I think that'll take time, but all in the Lord's time so that we can come to really trust him even more so. Yeah. So thanks for that, that question. Hopefully that, that helps. Um, great. We have uh, a convert who says the rosary. Bob, I'm glad you're, you're praying the rosary. Um, he says he, he prays the rosary, but he does feel like he needs to go directly to God. Um, Father Joe, any, any word to, to this individual? So I, I don't want to misinterpret it. It sounds like you're praying the rosary that you because you understand it's a good thing and yet maybe you're still not totally convinced that you need Mary to go to God and um, that it's it's really worth or maybe understanding fully who Mary is and the need for her father Joe what, what would you say to I, I think I mentioned this before maybe the last time of the time before but I, I, I don't think forcing a relationship is the best idea I think be at peace. Keep praying the rosary at peace and ask Jesus and God the Father and the Holy Spirit to help you in your relationship with the Blessed Mother. Uh, but I, I would say, especially because you're a convert, uh, this strikes your sensibility probably as, as odd or something. So uh, if, you're, if you're comfortable praying the rosary, pray the rosary um, and don't force it. Just I would kind of wade into it a little bit and, and ask the Lord himself, Lord, 
uh, show me how you desire a relationship to the Blessed Mother with me. And I would say if you ever feel prompted to talk out loud to the Blessed Mother, I talk out loud a lot when I pray in the car, while I'm walking, while I'm next to Father Adam in the chapel. It's kind of weird, but he gets over it. <laughs> um, just talk out loud. Talk to your, you know, talk to the Blessed Mother out loud like you would talk to your mother. But I, I don't think forcing it does a whole lot of good. Yeah, and today in our day of preparation, we talked a lot about trusting. And I think that goes hand in hand with not forcing it. It's like the trust is, yeah, just take advantage of where our Blessed Mother has you right now and uh, what she's able to do in, in your heart. And I was trying to think of it. I couldn't remember it exactly on, on the spot, but the, the convert, Scott Hahn, has this incredible story about um, in his conversion of, of praying the rosary. And I think it was something along the lines of he was just having a really hard time with the Catholic Church, but especially with Mary, and he just didn't understand it. This is still while well, he's a Protestant. He was told, just pray the rosary. Pray it for a whole novena or something. And he was just like, sure, okay, another Catholic superstition, whatever. I'll, I'll do it. I'll make you happy. And and it was amazing because in that nine days, his heart just was totally transformed. And all of a sudden at the end, like he got it. And it wasn't because he read this book or it wasn't because he like, you know, said like this prayer or anything. It was just that he trusted enough to pray the rosary, to enter into this relationship to Jesus through Mary. And she was at work kind of like getting into his heart, like breaking down some of those walls and barriers. And so I love that you're, um, you're doing that and going forward and um, trusting. Yeah. Uh, this is a, maybe a, a follow-up from someone else. Is it odd to not feel a closeness to Jesus, but extremely close to the Blessed Mother and God? I've been struggling with this, and I feel he's aloof with me. That's a great question. Yeah, I appreciate your, your honesty. What would you say about that, Father Joe? Should someone worry if they feel closer to, to Mary than, than Jesus? No, I would. We're complicated, folks. Are we not complicated? Like, we are complicated people. Psychologically, emotionally, physically. I mean, it's like, especially you women, you're really complicated. <laughs> I'm just saying that because it's Mother's Day. It's fun. Um, but really, it's like, so who knows, in a certain sense, why you relate to the Blessed Mother easier than you relate to Jesus? Um, I wouldn't see that as a problem because we know where the Blessed Mother leads, right? She, she never ends in herself. It's always leading to Jesus, who always leads us in the power of the Holy Spirit to the Father. So I, I would answer similarly to the last question about um you know, the last question we just had was, you know, be at peace. I would be, you know, she'll lead you where she needs to be in, the, in your good timing and her good timing and God's good timing. Um, just keep going down the path and, and tell her about that and tell Jesus. We got to make sure we tell Jesus. Hey, Jesus, I feel much more comfortable going to your mother and my mother than I do to you. What do you think about that? You know, like whatever you feel, tell Jesus. If you're mad at him, tell him. <laughs> He's really good. So this is what we do. Whatever's going on in your heart, you want to share it. So there's something called the pirate principle in the spiritual life. I can't remember if I explained this, but it's called the pirate principle because it's A-R-R-R, -R -R, like R matey. Um, and it's acknowledge relate receive respond so when you go to prayer you acknowledge what's going you know after a time you acknowledge what's going on in your heart i'm really scared i'm really scared you're honest with yourself that's acknowledged then you relate that you relate everything to jesus jesus i'm really scared then you receive what he wants to tell you or share with you. Maybe it's just silence. Maybe it's just peace. 
and then you respond to that. So the movement with the Lord is always acknowledge, relate, receive, respond. Acknowledge, relate, receive. You even do calisthenics, right? We'll all get in shape together, right? But that's it. It's can you imagine if every day you went to prayer doing that? You'd fall in love. You'd absolutely fall in love because you'd be sharing your heart and receiving his heart. That's awesome. Thanks, Father Joe. Appreciate the, the question, Susan. Hopefully that, that helps. Uh, so Douglas wants to know, what Marian apparition are you most drawn to? Oh man. Do you have to pick just one? That's rough. That's a rough question. Water? I'd be happy to, to start. Um, I have a heart for a number of the apparitions. The, the one in particular that has really done a lot for me and my faith life and even my vocation is the apparitions in Medjugorje that um, started in about 1985 to a couple of visionaries. And um, so Medjugorje, just east of Italy in former Yugoslavia. Friends, I went there um, for the first time after graduating high school and I was a new convert to the faith. I'd only been Catholic for four years. I'd fallen in love with our Blessed Mother through the Rosary, and I'd heard some of these incredible miracles of Medjugorje, which are a little bit more well-known. Just like a lot of people go there, and they see the sun spin. They see the Blessed Mother in different statues or trees or um, the cross lighting up in different places, rosaries turning into gold, people climbing up the apparition hill and bare feet and, um, and having like their cancer removed. And I was just like, yeah, I want to go there. <laughs> I want to go there and I want to see this incredible miracle. I want my rosary to turn to gold. I'm going to bring five rosaries. So they all turn to gold. And like, I just wanted to be blown away and all these things. And um, I went there as an 18 year old new to the faith and I was blown away. The peace of the city of Medjugorje is incredible. It's out, it's just in, in farmland and it's beautiful and it's peaceful and it's, um, the faith was just overwhelming. Like sometimes we can get a little embarrassed hang, having a rosary out in our hand or something. It's like you stand out if you don't have a rosary in your hand there. And I had never seen that before, different religious wearing habits and then the like the bathroom lines were out of control with all the people and they weren't bathroom lines they were confession lines in every single language imaginable right like everyone was going to confession and then like people packing into church i've never been more frustrated trying to get a seat to go to mass and i'm like annoyed and disgruntled and then someone said yeah when's the last time you've had to fight to get a seat in church i was like Oh, right. <laughs> Usually we're fighting to get out of church on the way out of the parking lot to go to whatever, like get home. And it's like, all oh, the people are packing the church. I'll admit, I didn't see a single sun spin. I didn't see an image of the Blessed Mother. But I've never been able to pray the rosary as easily, effortlessly, and joyfully as I have whenever I was there. And it was just effortless. I've never felt the love of our Blessed Mother so clearly as when I was there and um, just really did a lot for me to fall in love with more with Mary. Uh, these apparitions are not officially approved and, and yet from my experience even talking to some of the visionaries and I have no reason to, to doubt them. If it turns out that maybe they're not all true or something, I, that wouldn't rock my faith. I've just encountered um, the presence of Jesus and Mary there in a powerful way. And that's, that's something that I know is real. So, yeah. Father Joe, anyone for you that sticks out? I, I would agree with everything you said about Medjugorje. Um, the setting at Lourdes is unbelievable. Uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe, I, I would say... Oh, it's, it's an impossible question, but Our Lady of Guadalupe, because 
her words, you know, it's the only actual painting that we have given from heaven of the Blessed Mother is Our Lady of Guadalupe. It's like heaven painted this. Um, but also her words to Juan Diego are so comforting. And she called him so many times, uh, Juan Dieguito, like my little, my little Juan Diego, my little child. And she talked to him like a mother, super tender for her child. You know, where are you, listen, my dearest and youngest son, where are you going? Do you not hear the flowers say the hour of God is upon you? He shall be known and exalted. Uh, am I not here your mother? Am I not here who am your mother? Do you have anything to worry about? Do I not hold you in the crossing of my arms? Are you not hidden in the folds of my mantle? What have you possibly to fear while I'm with you? So it's this, because I, I'm, I'm, uh, I lack courage, I'll say, and, and a lot of different weaknesses that I struggle with. I, she's just been a tremendous comfort in my life. And I, I read her words to Juan Diego often. Awesome. Thanks, Douglas, for that, that question. Hopefully that, that helps. Um, I don't know an easy way, maybe if I were a more professional, like uh, whatever talk show host or something, I could make this transition. Um, thoughts on tattoos? <laughs> Love them. Tattoos, um, they aren't strictly prohibited by the church. And there are lots of different perspectives, Bible verses that people use for both sides. What do you think? What's your take? The, the, I, I don't, my take's a little bit tough. Uh, I, I, I can take it, Father Joe. You just tell me the truth. <laughs> this one should, I I not, should I not have got... I, my uh, my entire freshman uh, football team class was going was getting tattoos. We were the Bulls. I played for the Buffalo Bulls, so they all were getting tattoos on their arms. I really wanted to get it. I called my sister. She's like, "Wait a year. If you still want it, get it." And uh, I waited a year. All these other guys got tattoos, and then they changed the mascot. <laughs> so all these guys had mascot tattoos on their arm with the wrong mascot. Anyways, uh, here's why I don't like tattoos. I, I, I think I can think they're cool. My, my a pre, good, very close priest friend of mine has a huge image of Our Lady of Guadalupe on his arm. So, my, but my, my take is this, and I know probably some of you have tattoos, so I don't mean to offend anybody. Uh, I would say our bodies aren't, a, they're not ours, right? That's what St. Paul says. They've been purchased at a price. So my, my argument is always, and, and maybe there's a really good argument against this, our bodies aren't canvases that have been given for us to write on. That's what I would say. And people say, well, what about makeup? And I would say, makeup's not permanent. Unless you get like permanent eyeliner or something. I don't know. <laughs> so that that's, that's why... I, why I don't have any tattoos? Trust me, I have been so tempted. I want a tattoo. I want a tattoo. <laughs> but thanks, Father Joe. Maybe um, question on makeup. We'll we'll save for another day. Um, <laughs> tattoos. Uh, my thoughts go to well. It's not when we think about like the principles of morality objectively. No, I, the, the church doesn't say that there is anything objectively wrong with it. I do think there are circumstances and motivations that could definitely make it, make it wrong. So it's like, what is the tattoo that you want to get? <laughs> like, um, is it of a, a buffalo bowl or is it of something religious, something a little more permanent? Like, that makes a difference. Um, your intention. Why are you getting this tattoo that can be very revealing in terms of um, whether it's right or wrong for you in that time and in that that place and I do appreciate the the thinking wait always wait a year and, and kind of see if you still feel the same way but um, yeah 
we're supposed to be having like things tattooed on our, our hearts in terms of like our relationships and those things that are most important to us. And yeah, I just don't know that tattoos are the best expression of those things that are, are most important to us. I think that gets to something a little bit deeper in terms of like something that's just off in our, our relationships or even our, our sense of self. But I digress. Thanks for that question. Hopefully it, it helps. There's, um, yeah, I know a lot of perspectives on both sides, but hopefully those are some principles that help you to navigate. Um, okay, it's a good question. Shannon, thanks for asking. Is it possible to miss one's vocation? I'm so grateful that we have the former vocation director of the Diocese of Pittsburgh who has a great answer for that. Father Joe. We also have the future vocation director of the Diocese of Pittsburgh with us tonight, Father Adam. <laughs> Let's not joke about that. <laughs> I, I would, I, so I would qualify it, and you know, it's, this is kind of a lame answer maybe, but yes and no. Like, um, can you miss your vocation if you're um, like praying deeply and trying to listen to the Lord and telling the Lord that you want to follow him? I don't believe you can. I really don't. I don't think you can miss your vocation. So I think you can say no to your vocation. Like for me, I almost said no to my vocation. I was with this girl for a really long time. We were addicted to each other. I was 100% convinced God was calling me to be a priest. I almost said no. So would that have been me missing my vocation? It would have been me saying no to my vocation. Um, so I, I think you can kind of say no to it in certain ways. Maybe throughout your 20s and 30s, you lived a party life, got involved in a relationship, got married. Father Adam, maybe this has happened to you. I feel terrible when this happens to guys, but this happens every once in a while. Somebody will be coming out of mass, 50-year-old, 60-year-old, 70-year-old. I've had this many, many times. They'll say, oh, Father Joe, I was called to be a priest too. I just didn't answer the call and their wife standing next to them. I'm like, dude, not now, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think you, I don't believe if you are trying to live a life of grace, you can miss your vocation, but I think you can say no to it. I think that's a great answer. And I have had way too many of those experiences of people kind of talking about that in a way that um, is heartbreaking and, uh, yeah, there, there is, there's a consequence to saying no to the, the Lord if you know that he's, he's calling you to something. But um, I don't think it's necessarily as, as black and white as um, like a plan A, a plan B. God's cooperation in our will and following the passions that he's naturally given us to follow um, our own desires and the, the path that the Lord's set for us um yeah it's incredibly dynamic and, and works in cooperating with yeah what, what we choose in ways that we strive to be most faithful to um what the lord's calling us to in, in that moment and so yeah learning to say yes fiat and all things is great preparation for not missing our vocation if we can say fiat in the little things then we can say fiat in in the big things and that, that's where a spiritual director helps out so much if there's vocational questions, obviously. But also, like, sometimes with the Lord, I'm like, I get into these things like, Lord, did you want me to go left when I went right? Did you want me? And I start freaking out about discernment. And sometimes I throw up my hands and I say, I'm trying to listen to you. I'm saying yes to you. If I'm going the wrong way and I'm... I'm in all humility and reverence, but just with candidness with the Lord, I say, it's your fault. Like, you created me like this. I don't know what to do. I can't even see you. Like, so in a certain sense, it's like we, we do the best we can and trust that he, he gets us because he is one of us and created us. 
maybe if we have time for, for one more question. Um, Father Joe, what happens to an infant's soul when the mother has a miscarriage? Uh, bap baptism by desire and the child goes to heaven. Would be my really short answer. You? I mean, ultimately we don't know, but that would be what I would feel comfortable preaching because I believe it's true. Yeah, the Catechism talks about three different baptisms, baptism by water, baptism by blood, and baptism by desire. And that if you as a uh, Catholic parents have every intention of baptizing and raising all of your children in the, in the faith and through a miscarriage, you lose that opportunity. Yeah, the Lord answers that desire of baptizing that child and you can be at peace and knowing the, the Lord ordinarily works through water, but extraordinarily works through uh, even our firm and real intention to bring our children into the, the family of, of the Trinity. So, um, yeah, it, it's hard for me even to imagine the, the pain of, and loss of a, a miscarriage. I know that can be devastating. And so my heart goes out to all those who have experienced miscarriages and everything. But yeah, that's a real, that's a real part of it is that the mercy of God is fathomless, as St. Faustina says, right? It's beyond what we can um, limit and restrict. And so to appreciate the ways that the Lord's grace and mercy work, um, yeah, especially yeah. in those most devastating moments. Amen. And, and right, the, I, I can't imagine the pain either. Walked so many couples through this. But um, just like you are a mother, if you've had a miscarriage, you have a child. Because God gave that child a soul. And that, I, I love whenever I'm walking through a, a woman that has had a miscarriage, and a, 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 that you have a soul waiting for you for all eternity in heaven. That this child, the only disposition of this child is gratitude to the parents. Like, yes! <laughs> like, I'm going to live, I'm living in heaven forever. Can't wait till you get here. Like, that's, even in a miscarriage, a soul is created and goes to heaven, not even in a miscarriage, uh, in every conception. So these are souls that God just loves. And trust me, the souls of these miscarried children, they are deeply, deeply grateful for having been conceived. Awesome. Thank you. So a good note to, to end on, huh? Just, yeah, that, that joy and that, that hope we have from our Father. So thank you all. Uh, what a joy. And thanks for the, the great questions. We, we really worked the whole gamut of the spectrum from personal tattoos, apparitions, and, and everything in between. So thanks for, thanks for all of your questions. Thanks for your, your time. And Let's just ask uh, the Lord's blessing upon all of us as we close in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and loving God, we thank you for your faithfulness. You're a good Father and are always providing for us. Just beg for your blessing to come upon each and every one of uh, our viewers, our listeners, all their loved ones and family members. Give them every grace they need to always be faithful to you so they might be the saints you're calling them to be. To the intercession of our Blessed Mother Mary, may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Love you. We'll